question is that nobody tells you how to generate a W, and this is a big problem. This is a problem of searches. I will not talk about it uh, today at all. But the architecture of the model, it also depends on. You have to decide typical architectures out. Uh, the words are uh, sequences of speech sounds, context-dependent volumes, so parts of the volumes, and the data X, which is something which I'm very concerned about, but what is basically the data? The first question is that maybe it can be speech. And recently I see a lot of people uh, saying, yeah, this is the right way to do. I mean, you take the speech and you have a machine, which is a universal approximator, given an infinite amount of data, an infinitely large machine, you should be able to train it to whatever you want. This is a very reasonable strategy if you are, for instance, cricket or any insect, because that's what insect hearing basically is like. It takes a, there's a relatively simple sensory organ, and it's corrected directly into the neural, uh, central neural system, which is also very simple. Maybe some 10 million neurons. If we are higher level animals, just like human beings, and actually anything pretty much higher than insect, almost starting with the fish, but I think we have five, ten neurons, and so on and so on. The system is much more complex, the sensory organ is much, com much more complex, and processing goes in the the uh, stages from the, from the periphery up to the you know, cortex. And uh, so basically, it starts with a signal which is about 10 kilohertz per second. You get on auditory nerve, you have firings of the order of 1 kilohertz, uh, 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 per, uh, 1 kilohertz. and on the, in the uh, cortex, you may have about, about 10 firings per second. So there seems to be a reasonable information rate is actually that way, and we are trying to emulate that in engineering. So typical engineer, uh, machine learning uh, systems process the signal in layers, and uh, one after another, you get uh, the output which you want. And, uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, um, most often the first layer is what we call a feature extraction layer, which generates this mysterious X data and are being used for the rest of the uh, classifier. And I spent a lot of time in my life uh, uh, training uh, or finding what this data X should be. So conventional learning uh, machine looks like this, starts with a signal, we like features, this is as it's easy to do it this way. In the features goes your knowledge and your beliefs, the conventional techniques. Then comes the classifier. Classifier is being trained on the data which is if it were possible, come from the environment which is as close as possible to the target environment in operation. And uh, so feature X, I said, describes some aspects of the signal. Because, of course, here in this process, we would like to already reduce the bit rate, maybe going from this 10 kilohertz of the signal to, say, 1 kilohertz, uh, which you will see at the, the auditory nerve first. And so you have to leave something, or you, sh you are, we are typically leaving something out, and it's good. And a feature actually uh, should be uh, good features for classical recognized uh, classifiers are normally distributed because we like to use the classifiers which are, which are Gaussian or Gaussian mixture classifiers. And it's good if they are uncorrelated because uh, we like to use iron covariance matrices, it's easier to train a classifier. But I wanted to talk about the some aspects. So some aspects basically imply that you need to leave something out. And uh, so the question is, of course, if you leave out things which you don't need, then you make uh, life good. But if uh, whatever you leave out is lost forever in the process. So you have to be very careful. These are the compromises which we are always making. But if you retain too much information which you may not want from the classification, then your classification is going to be more difficult. Basically, your classifier will, have to, will need much more training data to train over all these sources of unwanted variability. If you want to leave out something, it makes a lot of sense to me to leave out the stuff which we don't need. Because it's very unlikely that this will carry the information which you actually need. So, the people work a lot uh, on, the, on the various aspects of uh, auditory modeling. Here we have one problem of, uh, which we want to leave out. This is a problem of, uh, of uh, different speakers. You can see that people are saying the same thing. You are yo yo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The message is the same, but the spectra look obviously very different. What helps is that if you use some basic aspects of the, of the from psychophysics of hearing, such as you take the power spectrum, represents the segment of the signal, and you go into 
critical bands moving, so you smooth the uh, uh, spectrum according to uh, critical bands of hearing. And then you may emphasize the higher frequencies, you emphasize lower frequencies, respecting the different sensitivity of hearing the different frequencies. You can also intensify loudness compression, which is a TV root or something like, something like that. And then finally, you approximate the whole thing with the regressive model, so your spectrum then turns into something which is more similar because the, what, what you did here, you did uh, smoothing, which perhaps your hearing might be to some extent going to. So that helps. Uh, I have a, a friend and colleague, this is a late uh, friend, who passed away several years ago, who was quoted. This is actually not very good. I mean, why should we put uh, properties of hearing into our machines? We are not uh, building uh, machines which are flapping wings. That's how he was quoted in the New York Times. Actually, he said something quite different. He said, well, you know, if, uh, airplanes do have wings, so they don't flap them. So, of course, we should put anything what we know about hearing and uh, auditory processing into the system if we can. But the only, the only thing is that we need to estimate the, the, the parameters of this processing from the data, because you can, can, may not get it exactly from the textbooks. So we came up and others too, I mean, we, can, we came up with a technique which we call data-driven features, where the features are being trained on the, on the, on the speech data, and classifier is also trained on the speech data. This speech, this data don't have to be necessarily the same, because here what we are trying to do is to derive general knowledge about it about hearing and about processing of speech. And the classifier then takes the data which, which uh, uh, are maybe specific to a particular task. So basic principle here is decide on the structure but and the parameters from the data. And basically it's some message which I want to which I want to convey. One of the very similar simple techniques which we tried some 20 years ago is just to find a proper ways of projecting a spectrum on a spectral basis. So for that you can use what is called linear discriminant analysis. Where so you, you create a lot of vectors of the speech, and each of them can be the label from which part of the, the, the label data it came from. So you have a big vector space, and you, each vector is labeled by the, by the class which you want to discriminate at the amount, you know, the speech sounds, and you get a discriminant matrix. And hopefully, the, especially the, the leading uh, bases are the ones which you, which you need. So leading bases, which actually cover very large amount of variability like this, what you can see is that the spectra, spectra are projected on bases which with a higher resolution at the beginning and lower resolution at the end. As a matter of fact, if you do the test, I mean, you do spectra sensitivity test, you can see that if you project on cosine bases, if you normally do to compute the text room, Spectral sensitivity is the same, but if you do this alleviated up basis, I don't know if it works or not. And so you can see that the sensitivity decreases with the frequency very much in a very similar way as if you project, if you smooth or process your data through critical hands. So, what we got here is very exciting in a way. You got the properties of human hearing from speech data without having system anything more than just do the spectral analysis. That was the only knowledge which, uh, which the system had. So how come that we got uh, the properties of human hearing from the speech data? There is a very tempted uh, uh, suggestion, which is like that speech might be optimized for human hearing over the millennia of uh, evolution. So very much the same way as an uh, information theorist would be designing a signal for noisy, uh, for noisy channel. So after this optimization of a millennia of evolution, you get a speech which fits human hearing. Basically, what you, what you hear well carries the information, what you don't hear well doesn't. So, uh, I mean, have it. Anyways, another problem which we have is the problem with the different frequency channels. And here we have a speech. Beat. And here we have the same speech, same speech, process, filter, so a pretty dramatic filter which basically made part of the speech, the spectra total flat. And, uh, for this, we designed a technique which was inspired actually by image processing. I know a lot of you are image processing people here. <coughs> by the Meyer, which suggested in order to, to derive lightness from 
from a luminance, uh, remove the components which are slowly changing. So we thought we would do the same thing. We look at the spectra, spectral trajectories. If we have a temporal trajectory, the spectral energy at the time of, of the material, put it through a filter, filter to some optimization. Basically, we would be suppressing the DC, passing components between 1 to 10 hertz. What comes out is the modified spectrum. We do it at every frequency, of course. And you end up with a spectrum which is different. What is good about it is that your problem went away, practically. It's also good. It's a practical problem in engineering. So working for the telephone company at the time, you had a problem with the recognized train on data from Belcore and tested it in the US West in Colorado didn't work. After this Rasta processing, this a simple filtering, uh, basically removed the DC and removed some higher motivation components problem in the way. So it was very tempting to see what our data driven analysis uh, would give us. So we had a problem we had a problem there, or the only thing which we needed to do was to do a different labeling. So we took the temporal trajectories of the spectral vectors and labeled it with a label of the phoneme in the center. Did the same thing. Those were the filters which came out. The impulse responses are here longer than about a couple of hundred milliseconds. Frequency responses passing components, modulation frequency components, the rate of change between 1 and 10 hertz, very much similar to this first process. So this was the past. Those are ancient days of the speech recognition. Where, uh, this is from age. So this is a present. Now, let me go to present because here I discovered that we are in a field where people work with neural nets. So let me tell you a little bit about our works in neural nets. Neural nets are very good for deriving the features because after all, posterior, they are good in deriving posterior of speech sounds. And posteriors are most efficient, the smallest set of features you can possibly have. If this is if you have a task to recognize or classify speech sounds. The classes can be complex independent phonemes. Those are the ones which we like to work with. They have a few of them and they are nicer. Can be complex dependent phonemes. If you are in the mainstream DCSR, like DARPA or IRPA, we are using parts of complex dependent phonemes. Chopped into thirds and so on and so on. So it is yours. But what you do is you take a signal and you end up with what we call posterior gram, which indicates how the posterior probabilities of the speed sounds change. This was one of the nicest examples to specify the We can take the posteriors and convert them into like labels because we know what the priors were and use it directly in the reserve. This is a technique which was designed by good Allen Americans in the early 90s, and Nick I remember the presentation. Another technique which we are using quite extensively is what is called tandem, in which you are trying to derive the features which can then be useful for conventional speech recognizers. That makes you a reference among the mainstream speech recognition. And basically that's the following thing. You train the neural net to, uh, to estimate the posteriors of the speech sounds, and then you take your vector somewhere from inside the net is favored to take the posterior uh, uh, measurements as close to the output as possible just before the last nonlinearity. And you, you decorrelate them using principal component analysis. And voila, there you have uh, data which are normally distributed because they are not posterior, they are before the nonlinearity. They are decorrelated because you did a PCA on that. And yeah, they look like a male cat star feature. You don't even have to tell people what it is as long well as it works. So this is one of the mainstream speech recognition techniques now in the mainstream uh, speech recognition in government research. I don't know what companies are doing. Uh, so that's what we do in ARPA or IAPA. <coughs> to move uh, really to the, the present, I, have to, I just want to show you a little, a little result which we just got very recently, so take it with a grain of salt. It's a, it's a research which is ongoing, it's not published yet, where we use the convolutiveness to derive to, to, in the first layer of the, of the net. So we use the net like this. I mean, it's essentially it's a temporal net, called convolutive net, which uh, uh, implies, the, again, FIR filters and in the first layer of the processing. Now, all the same, so the same colors in the same ways. So they are all interconnected and supposed to be the same. 
And the advantage is that after the training of the whole thing, you can look at these uh, uh, vectors and decide what, uh, what they do. So what they do is this. I mean, you know, you can see the frequencies, you can see the, the, the impulse responses, again, quite long, I mean, several hundred milliseconds at least. Here you see the frequency responses, again, enhancing the component, the relatively low frequency components. Some of the filters are suppressing DC quite heavily. There is one which keeps the DC because the data were not really distorted by any distortion to the data in this case. But well, this is pretty exciting. It's not published yet. I take it with a brain of salt, but I believe that. And since we are getting results, which I expected, I'm going to Okay, the last part. How much time do we have? Uh, you've got about uh, 15 minutes. Oh, 15 minutes. This is fantastic. Okay, so I speak a little bit too fast. I mean, I apologize for that. I want to tell you some stories about uh, inspiration which we are getting from physiology of hearing. I was working working quite extensively with the people at the University of Maryland, Lima Mesgaran, who is now at uh, Columbia, for those people who are in New York at the great time. So, you know, if you look at uh, what is called the recept cortical receptive fields, what is the cortical receptive fields, which are, which are measured by putting, literally putting a wire into, into part of the into cortex and observing which signal is, is there such a signal that which mostly excites the human neuron, you get a lot of various receptive fields. What you see about these receptive fields is that they are frequency selective, most of them. Not all, but most of them are. They are attended to different carrier frequencies. They also have a different temporal resolution. This one is a low temporal resolution. This one is higher temporal resolution. This one is a, this one has some spectral processing. This is a this is a low spectral resolution, high spectral resolution, this is a low spectral resolution, this is no spectral resolution. Basically, you pretty much get whatever you want. If you ask people who are doing these measurements, they tell me if you want something, tell me I will find it. However, if you look at the main properties, and that's what we did a little bit of this is a very paper which may be covered in the index, which I don't know if it is accepted. If you look at the principal components, of these uh, receptive fields. What you observe that basically the main principal components, again, uh, imply the band pass filtering between 1 and 10 hertz, just like we have seen over and over and over again in our data table filters, and we accidentally dis we discovered also when we were optimized the optimized dust filter, and they are looking at the spectral spaces of, of the order of of uh, octave, which is about three critical bands. This is some picture is spectral range, which is also interesting for number of ways in speech processing. So we have limited frequency range, and we have a long temporal context. So it inspires us that actually we should be modifying our vision of the auditory system. There are probably people who work in the physiology, which are, are just laughing how, how is it that we thought that there will be only one representation. Because what, you, what happens in auditory system is that indeed the, 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 the firing rates are decreasing as you go higher and higher, but what is increasing is the number of neurons, almost with the same proportion. So essentially what you are getting here is that it's not that you take a stimulus and you realize something for which is a lower, a lower information rate, but you, get, you take a stimulus and you derive a number of ways of looking at the signal. So very much you didn't lose all that much on the level of the cortex. I mean, it's approximation if you are engineering in that way. So now the question is, so we are not only exactly about the properties. Again, I mean, physiology probably doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, it doesn't come as a surprise. Hearing derives the multiple representations of the signal. And then you may have a, some technique, which we call it in, uh, in, a, in a, Psychophysical, psychology of cognitive science is called mega, mega cognitive processing, which, which uh, does performance monitoring, which picks up the best, so the best the streams given the data. Basically, it's a way of it's a way of uh, picking up the the, the the right stream as the situation changes. So, what may happen to you is that if the situation changes, so there may be a way of dealing with what is called unknown unknowns. 
Unknown unknowns are the problems which worries me very much in you know, machine learning in general. Unknown unknowns are the such a things which you don't expect. You haven't seen it in your training data. You don't even know sometimes that it exists. And uh, so the only way to deal with it, well, the only way, one way to deal with it is, is through adaptation. And we used to do adaptation in generative models by, by improving the likelihoods of the models and so on and so on. In the nonlinear systems, it's slightly more difficult, but this is one technique which would be consistent with what we know about, about uh, sensory processing, which is like sort of that you pick up the good things. Uh, from the data. So what we're proposing is the brightness as opposed to, not, not in addition to deepness. So the, your previous slide, is, isn't that consistent with ideas that uh, as you go up the layers, representations are higher dimensional and sparser? Yes. yes. Sparser in the time, but uh, the higher dimensional. Yes. Right. Exactly. And pretty much, I mean, what is amazing if you look at, uh, at, 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 at the counts, uh, almost no information is lost. It's just becoming much faster and slower. So what you get here is that you, basically in speech, you start with acoustic signal and all the level of the cortex, you end up with the acoustic levels, but you have many ways of looking at it. Thank you. Thank you. So, so this is the process. This is the proposal. We start with the signal, and we, we generate many processing streams, and then we do information fusion going to be smart, eventually, for the decision. Streams can be formed, actually, even across the modalities. I mean, you know, speech communication, obvious modalities are audio and visual. They can be different, in, uh, they, they can be within a modality, like in auditory modality, I showed you something which we already did a little bit. They can also be top-down and bottom-up dominated. So some streams are totally bottom-up, without any expectations of what you should see, but there are some streams which know very well what you should see and may not even be paying much attention to the signal itself. So those are what I call hallucinating streams. But they are equally valid in, in, in processing. And what we need, what we are working on, is a strategy for comparing these streams. And if we see the discrepancy, we, uh, we expect that there is an event which that wasn't <coughs> expected. It might have been a say, algo vocabulary word, or which you haven't heard, or word which in different language, uh, or, or some surprising thing which may happen when you hear something and you don't see it, or you see something and you don't hear it. So, so, and then we would like to have a strategy for optimally combining these streams. So how to pick up the, the good combination of the streams given the situation. And this again should be adapted. One of the old techniques which we played with already a long time ago is a uh, poor man's deep net, I mean, where we took signal and divided it into different sub bands, frequency bands, and trained the, 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 the following probability estimator of each band. And then we formed all non empty combinations of these frequency bands. So if you start with seven bands here, you end up with 127 streams. And then we try to find the reliable streams using the several, several techniques. If you want to know more about it, Sajita uh, Sharma's thesis is probably the best thing to look at this from, from OGI. The most recent re reincarnation of the uh, technique, which has been just worked on right now at uh, Hopkins, is that it uses a somehow fancier performance monitor. This performance monitor looks at the statistics of the outputs of the classifiers and compares with the statistics which we have seen in the training data. And if they disagree, we think that this combination is not good. So it works reasonably well. It even improves, this is a, a result on the thing. I mean, it's, it, it even improves the situation on green, because not, not always the, the best uh, combination is uh, of containing all the frequencies. It has a pretty dramatic improvement on the noise. Here we see what the proposed technique does with a performance monitor. And here we see what we would get if we knew what the answer is and, uh, and picked up the best answer by hand. Yeah, and so we were quite yeah, happy with that. And we're working on it. I'm still, I wouldn't say that we know exactly what to do. Certainly we don't know exactly what to do, but this is something which is still close and dear to my heart. Anymore. 
The last thing I want to mention is how can you deal with unexpected words? This is still the, also the old work we have done while I was in Switzerland. Some of you remember these days very well. Where we tried to have a recognizers, the two recognizers, one was a strong recognizer, one was a very strong words, with very strong, with very strong priors. Basically, it's a recognizer which has uh, English modeling and everything. And then there was another recognizer, which was a weak, it was just recognizing the phonemes. Didn't know, didn't have no knowledge of the words or anything, sort of thing. And in this example, this is a kind of green example, we had a digit recognizer and we left one digit out, namely three. Of course, the strong recognizer, which uh, expected three, uh, no, no, didn't expect three because it wasn't in a vocabulary, was putting in a different word. In this case, I believe it was zero. For the recognizer correctly saw the sequence three because it had no knowledge of the words. Only knew about the phonemes and phonemes were okay. If you measure the tail divergence between these posterior vectors, you see the big jump in the divergence, meaning these recognizers disagree. You, you are dealing with a word which you didn't expect, a word which you didn't expect, unknown, unknown. To conclude, I believe what we should, I mean, very, just to go along with the title, see, the, the knowledge of data, we should be trying to derive knowledge from the data, but this knowledge should be permanent and reusable, meaning like that if you are thinking about training of your neural network feature extraction, it's always based to look what the results are or what the results suggest, and perhaps next time you don't have to learn it anymore. Because the big problem with learning from large amounts of data is what I suspect. We are learning over and over again the same thing, which is common sense. I have seen that people trying to train the neural net or speed signal, just trying to learn the one-way rectification, which is clearly happening in the, in the, in the system, or trying to learn the spectral analysis. Again, I mean, it's clear that it happens in the we are proposing that yes, the processing should be deep because it should be done in the, in, the, in, the, in the cascade of the processing steps. So this is very much along the latest and greatest in the neural nets. But we also say it should be long. Basically, if you are in speech recognition, you should be looking at least over the segment, which is as long as the co-articulation part of, the, of, of your phonemes, which is a couple of hundred milliseconds at least because of the energy of the whole track. So long segments of the signal are important, I believe. And wide. Wide means you should be deriving many, many parallel streams and try to figure out the ways how to compare them and how to combine them. <coughs> so parameters of the net should be in the data architecture. Actually, it will be the one which is going to be permanent and just to uh, This is the point where I, I stop. I was so afraid to speak. I told you I had too much, too much coffee and it was a problem why I spoke in the past. But uh, I'm happy that we have a time for questions. Because uh, I would definitely love to. Yes. So one of the last things that um, is a sh I mean, a resurgence in uh, speech processing is all the things around recurrent neural networks and very memory about the signal D inside the processing pipeline? Yeah. So recurrent then is obvious way of introducing the temporal dependencies. Right? I mean so it's just like we have a FIR filters and IAR filters. All our processing was sort of FIR, I would say. We just take the signal as long as one second as an input, but at least a couple of hundred milliseconds. But recurrent net has it built in. So yeah, if you know how to train this or if you yeah, um, I think it's the right way to go. You, you showed the uh, cortical receptive fields. Um, I suppose they were in the primary auditory cortex. Um, uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, is there what is known beyond that? Uh, uh, you showed frequency um, and, and time, but are there more complex, or is it known what comes after this? 
And my second part of the question would be, have the people tried to reconstruct it? Like in Vision, we get, uh, you know, they, they very much looked like localized um, and uh, like, you know, edge filters, which we got, of course, from a sparse representation. So, yeah. Answers to both questions is yes and yes. So the first one is that is there some processing after that? It appears so. I mean, you, I point you to works from Hebrew University, Ellen Erken, and actually very recently he has some comments on a actually of a paper in the, in the Nature by Nima uh, Mesgarani. I can point you out to the actually maybe you may have it here, where they say yes. I mean, on a level of cortex, you can make features from the phonemes. And then, of course, the phonemes happen later, and, the, and then the temporal processing, binding these phonemes together, happens yet higher. We don't know exactly how, but that's what people hypothesize. And the second part of the question was, was it the first part of the second well, part? Well, so, so have they tried to, to, you know, just from learning, can you get them out if you're again just, um, yes. you know, trained with this on a sparse representation? Is this again sparse? Yes, I mean, the, so, so, we tried to use the actual receptive fields in the speech recognizer with some success. I mean, I don't know if that exactly answers the question. Uh, you know, it's like uh, Oldshausen field in the in the visual field where you, you know, you just train on natural images and uh, with PCA, you you, uh, you mentioned several times PCA, and I was a little bit astonished because we know in the vision in, in, in vision it is very much uh, ICA or, or sparse representation which makes all the difference. So PCA, I mean PCA, there was an analysis, but it's, it's again, it's, it's a full mens of approximation that really is happening. Uh, as far as, uh, as uh, learning what the human hearing system is doing, again, I mean, I only can tell you what I know about. I know the work of uh, my friend Nima, who just recently showed the, that he can, that he, he comes with the neurons which are paying attention to, to distinct features as very closely as defined all time ago by Jakobsen and Dubetskoy. So uh, that's what he sees on the auditory cortex of the humans, because he has access to human uh, cortex for the people who are pre-surgery for epilepsy. So he has some wonderful data and he worked on that. So again, I can, I can point you to the work. He was looking obviously for phonemes. We couldn't find phonemes. We found the features. And then the conclusion is probably phonemes that can go in a higher level. And of course, we are still working with the phonemes, individual phonemes. We are not working with the representations, like how they are bound into syllabi or how they are bound into words and meanings and that sort of thing. This is, well, as far as I can tell, is well beyond the, the, the experimental techniques available. I know the neuroscientists, so I'm just, <laughs> I shouldn't probably be in answer. Yeah, question. So, so the unknown, unknown problem that you talk about, which this community calls zero shot learning or one shot oh, learning, it doesn't. So, I just wonder, um, how far has this idea been pushed into government application, given that you're so close to the government? So in the industry, we don't. It probably, it probably, it's not. Let, it's me, last year. let me put it this way. So, we just spent the three years of of DARPA, okay. DARPA raised funding on this, and we came up with some solutions. But we didn't come with a final solution. Uh, of course, it would work. That would address plenty of problems which, which the government has. Can not beyond that, any better ideas of pursuing that goal? I know that you know for limited resource part of the government is very interesting. Limited resource, or I think that in general the problems of the unknown, you know, like unknown languages, not unknown, 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 unknown words. Yeah. yeah. So it's been more. I mean, we, we worked on it under the DARPA funding. Just expired. So it'd be fair to say it's still open problem? Very much okay. so, and I think it will be open problem for a long time, but I'm very happy to be able to speak to this community because I really think that this is one of the fundamental problems for machine learning. Is we are so much relying on hopes that the future is going to be the same as was the past. And we don't look enough at what techniques which adaptation techniques and how to identify the future is not the same as it was the past. Just identifying that you are dealing with work which you recognize that doesn't know it would be extremely helpful to do it reliably. I know from the practical situations you, you can see. So just a quick comment. Uh, it seems to me that you're uh, 
a known unknown is related to what Rich Sutton was telling us about uh, with changing tasks and yeah. uh, and behind these problems, it seems to me uh, a key concept is to learn high-level abstractions that uh, are applicable. That's what which features were really uh, to a large class of, of, of prediction problems or uh, changes in the environment. And I would I would favor that direction to uh, help us if, if, for this very it, difficult problem. Yeah, it might be it might be that my approach is very naive. But I think it's a consistent with what I know about about the sensory system, which is like generate many views of the of your stuff and figure out which ones are good and which ones are not. Right? So essentially maybe it's also a little, like, you would almost call it wasteful, right? So that you run all these all these parallel strings and then you use only some of them. But uh, you know the architecture is, seems to me relatively simple and I think it's consistent with what we know about the sensory system, about the perceptions and so on and so on. But I'm a more experimentalist than theoretician, so I, again, I, mean, I, would, uh, okay. I would be very happy if somebody comes with a solution. Mostly I would be happy if people really take it to heart and work on it. Because this is, I think, a problem of machine learning community, looking at all of us here. Like, why do we believe that training data represent the future of incoming data. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thanks. Uh, let's thank uh, Henrik again.